understand that that was more convenient to implement on a device uh, because all we need is, is sort of properties up to the third moment of these distributions. Uh, so I'm, I know I'm running out of time, but that's okay because I'm really just going to tell you about the results of the paper. I'm not going to explain how we proved it, although I'm happy to chat offline about that. Um, but you know, now that we have this ensemble and I said what a classical shadows protocol looks like, uh, the next thing we need is, is to be able to write down what the measurement channel is actually doing and, and hopefully to invert it. Uh, and that is one of the things that we did in the paper. Uh, we showed that the measurement channel, when you use either of these ensembles, uh, looks like this linear combination of projectors. And here are these P sub 2L. These are super operators that project you onto the subspace spanned by Majorana operators of weight 2L. Um, so, so one thing that this expression tells you is that this channel shouldn't be invertible. Uh, in fact, it ignores all of the odd parity terms. It zeroes them out. Uh, but that's okay. We, we, there's some work around us if you really care about uh, odd parity things. Uh, but it, in our case, we're just going to think about a pseudo inverse where we act on a subspace span by even Majorana operators. Uh, and then we can really easily write it just by inverting these coefficients. Um, okay, so we, we have a channel. We have a nice closed form for it. Uh, but you might wonder, how do we actually go and do the classical post-processing for the kinds of quantities? That was the sticky part of the different group in the first place. Can we still do it here? Uh, and this is the part of the paper I think I enjoyed the most, because it, it's a really nifty trick. We're ultimately after quantities that look like this. The trace of, of this matrix element I was telling you about, where that's um, some Slater determinant that comes from our classical algorithm. And then we apply the inverse channel to the sample that came from our shadow protocol. Uh, and so how do we calculate quantities that look like this? Uh, well, the first thing to note is that if this projector wasn't here, we would really know how to do that already. Then everything would just be sort of inner products of different fermionic Gaussian states, and we could use something that sort of like a generalization of Wick's theorem for that. Uh, these graphs and algebra techniques give you lots of tools there. But how do we incorporate this projector? Well, there's a trick which I won't, I won't show you all of the steps, but we can think of this thing in here as you know, some linear combination of a bunch of Majorana operators. Uh, and we can uh, insert this auxiliary variable I'll call Z. And what we do is we find a way to stick a Z in everywhere we have a pair of Majorana operators. Uh, so that what we would really like to do is, is take this term and just collect only the terms with Z to the L in them and throw away the rest. Uh, but then we just imagine that that Z is there, and we forget about the projector, and we go through essentially the same kind of calculations one would do uh, without the projector, but we take the Z along with us, uh, and we get that this expression can be written as a polynomial in Z, uh, where there's some, some constant factors here, uh, and then there's a Fabian that depends on two matrices that I'm not going to define for you, but they're efficient to calculate from, from these pieces, and they're sort of reasonably sized 2n by 2n or smaller, depending on the number of particles in your system. Uh, and then all we have to do is, is use this kind of polynomial interpolation technique that you saw mentioned in the last talk. And so we just evaluate this at some fixed values of z, uh, which we know how to do because it, it reduces to sort of things that we, we already understand. Uh, and then we can recover uh, the coefficients of this polynomial for any of the any of the powers of z to the l. And those are exactly the different terms here in this sum. Uh, so once we do that, that gives us a way of efficiently evaluating this overlap. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say uh, before I close, and hopefully have time for a question or two, uh, is that we also uh, worked out an expression for the variance of, of this kind of estimator. And we weren't quite able to bound things in a very nice closed form analytical way. But we could use our, our sort of expression for the third moment of this distribution to write down something that we could efficiently compute to bound the variance. And what we did then is we went and we figured that, you know, if, as long as we can do this on a thousand qubits, we're probably in good shape. So we went and, and calculated up to 500 particles in a thousand qubits. You know, what does this variance look like? And everything we see is consistent with it, it really being asymptotically bounded by square root of n, log n, right, and it's the number of qubits. Um, you know, on, on a NIST experiment, if, if we get up to 50 or 100 or 500 qubits, we're, we're obviously very happy. Um, and so this variance is, is reasonable. Uh, in the paper, we also talk about bounding the variance for some other quantities that one might want to, to estimate, but I'll, I'll skip those for the purpose of brevity here. 
uh, and just say there's much more in the paper, including some expressions that one might use if you were, were trying to generalize this work to other estimate other sorts of quantities besides the ones that we were talking about, uh, a lot of fun grass and algebra tools. Uh, and thank you very much for, for paying attention. I'd love to chat offline if folks are interested.